Now, molecular compounds, because of isomerism, among other things, the names of molecular compounds tend to be more complicated. And one thing that they do is very often include numeric prefixes. And we need to do that to distinguish between different types of compounds in which we find the elements in different proportions. In some ways, though, this is similar to naming ionic compounds. The first stage is to list the more metallic element first. We would do the same when naming an ionic compound, right? Then we add the less metallic element using an ide suffix. Again, kind of similar to how we would name an ionic compound. Um, but the key step here that's really different from the ionic compounds is in step three. We got to add prefixes to potentially one or both of the element names to indicate the number of atoms of each type. In the molecule and this is generally done when that number of atoms deviates from one so an example of this for instance would be n2o4 nitrogen is more metal like it's further to the left on the periodic table than oxygen so we're going to list nitrogen here first oxygen is less metal like and it's more anion like in the compound we would say and so we're going to list that as oxide using that ide suffix to replace its ending. I'm actually going to move this over to give myself a little more space. because I'm going to need it because we need to indicate the numbers of each type of atom in the compound. So nitrogen has two. We use a di prefix. So these are Greek numeric prefixes. Four, we use tetra to indicate that there are four oxygens. So the name here is dinitrogen tetroxide. Now here's a different compound of nitrogen and oxygen with a different name, NO2. This compound still contains nitrogen and oxygen, and so it's still a nitrogen oxide. That hasn't changed. Still nitrogen and oxygen, but now there's only one nitrogen in the molecular structure, one nitrogen per molecule, and so we can leave this as nitrogen. You'll sometimes see mono to indicate one. And there are now two oxygens instead of four, so we're gonna name this nitrogen dioxide instead of dinitrogen tetroxide. And actually, in the tetroxide name, the A is usually omitted uh, if it would result in two vowels being next to each other. So dinitrogen tetroxide there, not tetraoxide. The second compound is nitrogen dioxide, and this is a different compound from N2O4, hence it needs to have a different name. But this gives you an idea of how to name molecular compounds using that less metallic element for using that more metallic element first, less metallic element second as an anion, quote unquote, and then these Greek numeric prefixes to indicate the numbers of atoms within the molecule. So that's a general approach to naming molecular compounds. Certain types of molecular compounds are approached in different ways. So binary acids, for example, uh, which contain hydrogen linked to an electronegative nonmetal atom. So these we would represent in general as something like H, M, X, N, uh, some number of hydrogens linked to some non-metal atom, X. These are called binary acids. And particularly when X is relatively far to the right on the periodic table. So group 17, group 16, group 15, these are the binary acids. So compounds of nitrogen, sulfur, oxygen, the halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine are what we think of as binary acids. How do we name the binary acids? Well, we, we begin with the, na the name hydrogen. Hydrogen is cation-like in these compounds. And to, to understand that, we can realize that the nonmetal atom attracts electrons more to itself than the hydrogen. This is because in attracting electrons to itself, it, it gets closer to a number of electrons corresponding to the closest noble gas, right? These X atoms tend to want to form anions, and so they attract electrons to themselves. That leaves the hydrogen with some, some positive charge, so it's, it's cation-like. These are not full charges, but the hydrogen is behaving like a cation. It's got some partial, partial positive charge, not a full plus one, but maybe point plus 0.02, something like that. And the X atom has partial negative charge, minus 0.02. And so we think of the, the nonmetal atom kind of as an anion, using the suffix ide to indicate an anion-like character to the ion. Again, structure and nomenclature are interrelated. 
the, the reason we do this is because the molecular structure reflects the idea that the nonmetal, the other element, is anion-like. And the hydrogen is cation-like. So for something, just to give a quick example here, something like HI, which is a binary acid containing hydrogen and iodine, the name is hydrogen. That's the cation-like part of this molecule. Io died, where we've replaced the ene suffix of the element name, iodine, with id to indicate its anionic character. Now, one exception to this that you will certainly see, not really an exception, just an alternative naming scheme, involves the hydrogen halides being dissolved in water. So when we take HI, which is a gas by itself, really nasty gas, having worked with this myself, uh, when we take HI and dissolve it in water, we generate something that is significantly different in character from the, the gaseous HI. It's a liquid solution, all that good stuff. And so we change the name. We use the name hydroxic acid, where the X is kind of the root name of the, the halogen without the ene suffix. So for HI, uh, HI in water, HI gas dissolved in water, we would call hydro iodic acid. Hydroiodic acid. You'll see that naming scheme used for binary acids in the halogens as well. Hydrochloric acid, hydrofluoric acid, etc. Last but not least, I wanted to talk about the oxy acids, which contain hydrogens linked to one of these polyatomic oxy anions that we've seen previously with a central atom linked by double or single bonds to oxygens. And so the oxy acids, which have this general formula H, M, O, and X, contain acidic hydrogens linked to oxygens, in turn linked to another central element. To name these, we really think about that um, polyatomic anion that would result if we replaced all the charges, uh, if, uh, if we replaced all the hydrogens with negative charges, and then named the anion that would result. So for example here, in thinking about HBrO2, remove the hydrogen and think about BrO2 minus. What would we call that? We'll come back to that. Let's do the other. So ClO3 with an H. Let's replace that H with a negative charge. ClO3 minus and then HIO4. Let's again replace that H with a negative charge. IO4 minus. And if we had two H's, minus two, three H's, minus three, etc. BrO2 minus is bromate. BrO2 minus is bromite. ClO3 minus is chlorate. And IO4 minus is per iodate. Not to be confused with period eight, per iode eight. And to name the resulting acids, so the, the compounds in which we add that proton back, right, going back to the left, to name these compounds, we replace that suffix with a specific uh, suffix to, to the acid. So if it's ite, we replace with us. So this acid would be called brom-us acid. HClO3 has eight on the end. Eight is replaced with ic, so this would be called chlor ic acid. And finally, 8 again is just replaced with ic and the per stays on. So we would call this per iodic acid. Looks like periodic acid, but it's per iodic acid. So three examples of naming oxy acids. You'll see these names in, in various places um, throughout your study of chemistry. And they do kind of follow a system in terms of being related to the polyatomic anions that we get if we replace the hydrogens with negative charges.